What's up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of the Six Figure Vet Podcast, where we share the success stories of veterans that have successfully unlaced the boots. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on all streaming platforms and give us a follow on the gram at the Six Figure Vet. Let's go. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of the Six Figure Vet Podcast, where we showcase the success stories of black and brown veterans who have successfully unlace the boots. Now today we have the host and founder of the Abundant Behavior Podcast, Mr. Ollie Banks, coming through to talk to us about the importance of the black male's mental health. Ollie is the epitome of holding things down and moving in a positive direction and holding oneself accountable with putting footwork to vision. Ollie isn't just the host of the Abundant Behavior Podcast, where he motivates others to have a more abundant life. Ollie is also a well-established photographer, father, aspiring motivational speaker, and entrepreneur, y'all. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Ollie Get Money Banks. I appreciate that introduction. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on your platform. It's definitely you. A definitely a great opportunity to speak on this mental health money, especially for black for black men. It's definitely something that we need to speak on more and more. I feel like there's not a lot of spaces uh, open for us to speak on it, so I'm definitely grateful to be in this uh, opportunity today for sure. Most definitely. And when I was thinking about like, okay, I need to have a black man on, I need to have a black man on that is all about positivity and that is not afraid to speak up about mental health. Like you was the first person to came to mind because you are so positive and I just feel like within your own platform, you show up so authentically. Like you don't just, you know how sometimes you have those gurus that's just like, yeah, you know, today I made a billion dollars, but yesterday I was broke sleeping in my car. Yeah, no, nah, like, I'm showing the footwork, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm showing people what hard work and consistency look like. Like a lot of people right now, they like, man, you two seasons in, twenty four episodes, less than two years. That's a lot of work, you know. That's a lot of work. It's consistency. It's like not even worrying about the views. You know, I get you get caught up in that a little bit too, right? And that's a part of mental health, but it's just staying consistent because you know the end goal, like, you know, so I appreciate that. Of course. And I definitely want to touch on how, you know, with being showing up as your authentic self and in this world of content creation, where you're trying to become something, I feel like whatever field you pick nowadays, you it, it comes with content creation. I don't care if you a masseuse, right. like you going to end up in content creation if you're trying to get your brand out there. So right. I definitely later on in the episode want to talk about how not to do that. Um, how not to get caught up in the numbers and the likes and right, exactly. why my shit ain't going viral yet, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, that that whole conversation with yourself, yeah, that's very important for sure because you do get caught comparing yourself to other platforms. Um, because you know nothing is new under the moon and stars, so you out here like, okay, what they doing? All right, let me let me see if I could do it this way and that way. But it's just like whenever it's, I've come to realize, like it's literally. You can put the work in. You can put up the best video out, the best 30-second clip, 20-second clip. God going to move it where it needs to be when it needs to be moved. You know what I mean? Whenever yeah, most definitely. So that's, that's just super important. Knowing, like, you're doing it for more than the transactional part of it. It's for more, like, relationship-based things, like, to serve him. So as long yes. as your platform is to serve him, it shouldn't matter if you're going viral or not. It should be if you're serving him, knowing like at some point when he's ready to shed that light on you, you got all the tools inside of you because he's been building you up all this time, you know? Love that. So with this being mental health awareness month and with the conversation surrounding black men's mental health, I would like to ask you first, black man, how are you doing today? How is your mental? Oh, uh, Mentally, I'm great, you know? Oh, we love to hear it now. Great. I'm, I could run through a wall right now. If I, if I was any better, I'd be in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I feel great, man. You know, I get my morning routine in, you know, dropped my son off this morning, uh, went and got some breakfast. You know, I just like to take care of myself. That's really important to me. At this like age that I'm in right now, I'm just making sure the right people are around me and I'm surrounding myself with positive people and good food, man. That's the good another thing too, like really working out and like eating good whole foods. That's like really important, man. So I'm great this morning. 
I love to hear that. So give us a little bit of backstory about Ali. Um, for you, for you, for you, the listeners that don't know uh, who you are or, or a little bit about your background, he comes from the, the Chicago. So I want to hear a little bit about, you know, how you grew up. What was it like living in Chicago? Who was Ali? Was you, uh, wait, were you, are you from 63rd? <laughs> See, look, you funny. <laughs> no, I'm not actually. So I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I, I was born in the hundred. It's it's crazy being on this side of the interview because I'm I'm used to asking these questions to other people. So I was born on the south side of Chicago, born and raised, and I moved around a lot, a lot. Like we was, uh, I went to school in the hundreds predominantly. So like, if you're not from Chicago, people that's from Chicago, they gonna know what I'm talking about. We moved around a lot. I lived on the east side of Chicago. I was born on the west side of Chicago. Um, and my, my upbringing, you know, like most black people, you know, you grow up in the low income community, you know, you barely have much, but you, you make do what you, what, what you have. And I think like a lot of my, the way I am today came from like my beginning, like I didn't have much. So I learned how to appreciate what I do have a lot, a lot sooner. Mm-hmm. But that was very important on my journey. Just knowing I come from home beginnings and I, it always gave me a drive to make it out. Like I always was starving to make it out, make it somewhere, you know? So yeah, it was. It, it, I, everybody have their adversity growing up, you know. Um, dealt with bullying in third grade, like real bad because of my skin color, like, and because of that, I was really insecure. And that led those insecurities led up from high school, even in the early parts of the Navy. Um, I really had just didn't like uh, have confidence in myself, and that's super important. Like a lot yeah. of the childhood trauma can't like that that builds up over time because it's never resolved. And yeah. you just never know why it's pouring off into like your relationships, like yeah. the way that you do work, the way that you interact with people. You like you think back, like man, okay, maybe I should fix this, that, and the third. So yeah, that was like so a lot of my childhood, man. I try to like put it in the back of my mind because it was it was terrible, especially third grade, man. It was terrible. We didn't have much. We got made fun of for the clothes, and you know, so like I always wanted to be something. Like I from that. That always made me want to be something. Like, but just being, but I just always wanted to be something. And so <laughs> that's what I told myself I was going to do, man. I wasn't really good at school, but when I decided to join Navy, I told myself I was going to hit the ground running. I didn't care what it took. I had to be successful. Like, I had to prove people wrong. Like, that was that was my driving force in the beginning, just proving people wrong. Like, showing people that I am somebody. I am something. Like, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what made you choose the Navy? You know, you saying, I want to be something. And you right. got, like, I'm from Alabama. We ain't got no legends from in Alabama. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got Charles Barkley, but that's about it. I got Gucci. If you don't even claim us. <laughs> he don't even claim <laughs> us. Phones, he claim Atlanta, for real. But he from Alabama. You got to do that. Right, research. right. Look, he from Bell. You got to dig in the history books to find out Gucci from... from- <laughs> And I only, I only know that because it's crazy because my brother's wife is related to Gucci some way, somehow up people in Alabama. It's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's funny. So yeah, the Navy actually is because I had a cousin at the time. This was like 2014. One was in the Army, one was in the Navy. Every time they would come home, the whole block was shut down. They had uh, like, I was just enticed. They had all the women. They had nice <laughs> cars. They had really nice clothes. And for me, I'm like, the military doing that for y'all? Right, I mean, man, I gotta see what's to it, and so I'm talking to him. My cousin, he done been in San Diego. He's still in EN one. Well, yeah, he's an EN one in San Diego. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm seeing him in San Diego. He was in Bahrain. I'm like, man, like, and my brothers, they like, man, the Navy is this. I'm like, I'm trying to see what that's about. I'm like, why would I go to school when they getting paid to learn something? I was like, man, if I get paid to learn a skill and get out of Chicago, please sign me up. So I went in there, man. At the time, I ain't know how important the ASVAB score was, but. I scored a thirty six. If you know, you know. Look, they said what you what you what you got. I said what y'all got for me. They said you could be a cook. I said, hey man, please I, oh, sign me up. Sign me up, man. And it was the best decision of my life. <laughs> the best decision of my life ever was to join the navy. But yeah, it was just watching my cousin's success from afar and just wanting to like. It was material at the time, but at the time that was my driving force, and it got me to where I am. You know, and you start to realize the material stuff is not important. As you get older, you know what I mean? But originally, it was just the money, to be honest. I wanted to just touch a bag. <laughs> Listen, I understand. I feel like, you know, with most of the African-American or Latina, black and brown um, military members that I know, we very, very select few of us 
don't come from humble beginnings. Right, you know. Like, most of us came from the hood, a project, or just, like, low-income families. So, that's our driving force. Like, I don't know what I'm about to do, but I got to get the up out of here. Yeah, like, I yeah. got to go. It was super scary looking at, man, because I'm looking at, like... <laughs> I'm looking into the cooks. I'm like, man, they do look like they don't be, they don't get no respect on the ship. Just from like, if you looked at it, I'm like, man, I don't know if I'm making the right decision. But I said, I had to step into the unknown at the time. I really just didn't care. I needed to do something. I needed to do something. Because I college, it was over with for me, man. I partied. I just, my grades was well enough to stay on the baseball team. I ain't even played baseball to my senior year. I like stopped junior year. I was just, I said, all right, I'll go ahead and do it. But you know what's crazy about that? My brother went to take his ASVAB score. I went just because my like junior year. And I really just like was in there just because. And I just playing around. Playing around and I used that same score to get in a year later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's all in God's. We time. don't advise that. Listen, we no, advise you to study for study. your ASVAB yeah, for sure. if this is your exactly. plan. Study. Please don't wing it like me. Don't wing it. You know, I listen, mean, he be on social media flexed up like y'all just joined for three years, just joined for four yeah, years to change your life around. Man, it's nah, you gotta really be intentional. Like it's 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 more to that, but that's the head that you gotta have that you wanna change your life when you go in. And that's what I went in there thinking, like I wanna change my life. And when you had that mindset, you just pull everything around you that's changing your life. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Right, right. And definitely, you know, when you first came on, you talked about, you know, having a solid group of friends. And that's one mm-hmm. thing that I love about the military. Well, I can't say the military as a whole, but definitely the Navy and definitely the command that we came from. Um, Around man, that time I met y'all, man, y'all were some superheroes. <laughs> yeah, all of y'all were my mentors at the time. I was looking at y'all like E5s, nice boots. Man, you just was like black people squared away telling me the right things. Right. Telling me the right things. And that's the reason why I excelled above my peers so fast in the Navy. Like, I made CS2 really, really fast. A lot of people was like, he going to do 20 years. But I was just super serious. Like, I came from nothing. So, right. I'm like, man, this is, I said, how, y'all, we don't got to take no tests. I don't got to go filling out Scantron every day. I don't got to go to class. All I got to do is, you say get a pen? I said, oh, man, what? Right. Easy Morning. day. <laughs> I come from a hustler mentality. Show me the money. I'm going to go get it. <laughs> Y'all was all telling me, get your pen bags, get your pen bags. I'm like, oh, well, they, hey, that's what they saying, do. Listen, once you get your pen, it's, it's ain't nobody. I was an E2 with a, with two pens. I was, they was like, oh, yeah. Oh, this boy on fire. Yeah. Fire, yeah. yeah. You like that. <laughs> I like that feeling, too, because I wanted to be a part of the elite, the elite black and browns on the ship. Man, that's what I was thriving for, because that's what my I was mirroring my success against at the time, you know. And y'all led, led me in the right direction. I, a lot of those tools y'all instilled in me, I still use to this day, for real. And that's a real thing. I think, you know, maybe this is a taboo topic to talk about, but there, there's like this silent elite group of black people that, you know, was <laughs> yeah. on our ship. No, and not. we, we, it was like, mm-hmm. Close we was so locked in mm-hmm. and we it was like we didn't even have to hold each other accountable we just matched each other's standards like okay all of standards. us gotta have pens yeah, all of us gotta look that. good yeah like it we was gonna dope. all look out for each other nah it was dope yeah no nah, no nah, fact that's what it was and to touch on the topic of mental health being on that ship is really hard but when you have people around it like that it's like family yeah those those long days turn to fun days like everybody asks like if you go back and be any other rate what would you be i love being a cs i met all of y'all being a cook yeah you know, i met some a lot of my best friends to this day were fsas where if you guys don't know those just the, the tenants that come help the cooks but some of those are still my best friends you know what i'm right. saying so like that i really because i like being around people relationship and being a cook it was like that relationship based like yep. you, know you learn how to network mm-hmm. no for sure yeah yeah, you use that to your advantage for sure. Most definitely, most definitely. Yeah. And I, I, Ali, I wanna, I wanna switch gears here. I feel like we don't yeah. talk enough about the anxieties, mm-hmm. um, and like I guess the depressive episodes or loneliness that being in the military could bring, especially when you first starting out, right? Like you don't really know anybody and then don't mess around and have to go on a deployment. Yeah. Right. right How how do you, how do you deal with that? Especially being a black man, especially being a black man from Chicago. Well, let's back up a little bit. What, 
you you come from a fairly large family. You have older brothers, two, um, two older brothers, a younger sister. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, and I know you were um, you're close to your mom. You were super right. close to your dad. Rest in peace. Mm-hmm. Right. What was your first introduction with mental health, or as a man coping with stressors as a man in Chicago? Oh man, you talking you. T- 2019, 2019 was the first time I ever, like, was conscious of, like, oh, you could. No, I'm not going to lie to you. So this is the thing, too. Like, the relationship I was in, you know, my son's mother, Amanda, she used to talk about it a lot. And I was one of those ones, like, depression, man, just just get up. Like, like you ain't depressed. Shake it off. Shake it off. Like, what you just, just get up. Like, until I went through it myself, and I was like, oh, this is real. It's like yeah. a feeling that you get inside of your stomach whenever you like you just can't move, you're not motivated, and you don't know why. You want to so bad, but you can't. You know. Yeah. So that was like the run of first, like 2019. Uh, because I when I got out here after deployment, I just was like, okay, that that six years on that five years on that boat was cool. Those deployments was cool, but I have a son now, and I'm not trying to leave him again. What can I do next? And I started to I started to sell life insurance. The, the dudes that that was doing they was like real nice dudes. I was wearing suits, and they was entrepreneur minded people. A lot of us, a lot of them don't do it anymore. None of us really do it anymore. But it was just the connections we made, and they yeah. were talking to me. And their mindset shift. They was like, "Man, you need to be reading some books, bro. You need to be working out. You need to be learning about finance, man. You need to be doing this and that." And like, when you around so much fire, you feel bad being around these guys, and you're not doing nothing. You're not producing. You're not bringing nothing to the table. And mm-hmm. so I kind of forced myself to get better because I'm asking these dudes like, man, because hey, they was making money in the business. I'm like, man, how y'all doing this, this and this? They're like, man, you got to be praying. You got to be this. You got to be sharp. And I'm like, bro, I want to make some money. All the dudes that was making money, they was showing me that was super successful with working out. They mental was straight. Their relationships was good. Their kids was good. Like they life was everything that they did reflected their money. The money was just a byproduct of the rest of it. And so I'm like, all right. Man, what? All right. You know, and I would ask my homie Tim, like, that's like my brother, like my mentor, like to this day, like he the reason, bro, I got out of the Navy and everything. He just told one day, I was just like, bro, I see you working hard. You so consistent. He said, I mean, I said, what is like the trick to it? He's like, bro, he simply looked at me and said, bro, it's just God. From that day forward, I swear to you, I, every year I pray that my relationship with God gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Every year, that's what I pray for. My life has went up ever since that conversation. That was around the time when I stopped talking to God. That's super important with your mental health. You stay connected to a, a higher power. Like, yeah. You know, because you're in this world, but you, you didn't make this world. So you have to be able to, like, connect to something that, um, that, makes, that makes stuff make sense to you. Yes. You know what I mean? So that was super important. But to answer your question, it was ni- 2019. And you talk about childhood trauma not being resolved. You talk about teenage trauma not being resolved. And you talk about me being an adult trying to be in a relationship, having a kid. I still don't know what, what, I still don't really know what therapy is. I really don't know what anxiety is. I really don't know what depression is. I really don't know what the brain does. I don't really know my own body. I'm drinking. I'm not eating right. Yeah. So around this time, I know like what I'm going through, I'm trying to pivot, you know, and then it just slowly but surely every year I build on it and build and build and build and build. I got older and more mature. You stick your hand in a fire, you're going to get burnt. You get older, Every you time. go back to that fire. Right. And that's what just happened. You just learn from your mistakes and you get wiser over time. And you're like, all right, I knew that wasn't serving my mental back when I was 19. Maybe I shouldn't go down that road again. Just knowing, having more self-awareness and just being cognitive, like, all right, I know that was something that triggered my depression around that time. Maybe I should mm. just that fire, you know? Yeah. Knowing those triggers, what does... What does addressing childhood trauma looks like? What does that look like for you mm-hmm. from the black male perspective? Because I think you are the first black male that I've heard openly admit to having mm-hmm. childhood trauma. Because I f- and I don't think it's a, the yeah. black male's fault. Let me throw that out there. I think that we have not given black men the permission mm-hmm. to say things from their past hurt them. Yeah. I don't think that we've given you guys that permission. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be real transparent. And you you can share this, you know. So my mother was addicted to crack cocaine until about the age of nine. So that just gives you like a blueprint of how my childhood was for a long time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you start to grow up and you like, all right, we used to do this. This makes sense. 
So why do I do this and this? And it was building up. It wasn't really the adult trauma that was bothering me. It was a lot of stuff from my childhood. So I'm like, yeah. all right, you got to go back and dig. But for me, my biggest thing was getting real big into like psychology. Mm. I started to learn how people were. I started to learn why. And you, when you learn the world around you and the human body, you start to be like, okay, now it makes sense. It gives yeah. you clarity. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I feel like it gives you, it, it provides you with a way to give people more yeah. grace. Yeah. And so I had to just dig back and like have, uh, you have to go back and have these uncomfortable conversations with your parents. That's mm. what it is. A lot of people, they don't, they don't have these, but you know, <laughs> I have a great mother and she opened the floor for those conversations. She opened the floor for transparency. She opened the floor for us to talk about her addiction. My mother's over 20 years clean to this day. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Through the grace of God, you can't be delivered for that. So that's where my drive comes from. My big heart is just like, man, I seen what God brought us from as a family. And you yeah. look at your family and nobody would ever know that story. Yeah. You know, because nobody wants for anything. You know what I'm saying? We all are, are, are well, like, you know what I'm saying? We're pretty, we doing pretty good for ourselves. None of my family has to ask each other for money or, you know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. big in the black community. When everybody that's in the immediate huge. family has their own money, their own stuff going on, you know, so that's like, I'm just so grateful. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's yeah. a unicorn family almost. Yeah. You got to And that's how it's usually only just one person, maybe two of you left. Yeah. It's yeah. like one. It's like, I was thinking about this. It's always like one key person doing everything. And nobody can ever get anywhere if ever, nobody's contributing equally. And yep. so that's, that, that was like digging back. Like you have to just have gratitude. That's what like from childhood trauma, just having gratitude. Some things had to be talked about, you know what I'm saying? But just knowing those triggers, like, you know, trauma isn't what you went through. It's the, the long lasting effects of it. So just knowing those, just knowing those, you know what I'm saying, triggers, just knowing the environments and just like having grievance with yourself that sometimes stuff that you went through, you won't have those conversations. You won't have any clarity. It's just like, let's just try to get better. You know what I'm saying? And that's, yeah. man, it's just having conversations with people that's being real with me. You know, the women that I keep around me, you know what I'm saying? One of them told me, she was just like, you just like to use yourself as a punching bag. Like, you just like to just bring it up over and over again just to use yourself as a punching bag. Just like, sometimes you really not going through nothing. You just want people to, like, sympathize for you. And I had to, like, really sit back and take that in. And, like, sometimes I do that. Mm. That why me mentality all the time. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But you're in a well-off position where 100% of people will want to be. Yeah. You, you just have to be grateful, like, Sometimes they, it won't get answered for you. Sometimes you won't get that clarity of why you did have to go through this. Just know it's all in God's plan. Yeah. I'm great today. You know what I'm saying? I'm blessed. So, mm -hmm. You talk about, you said sometimes you have to have these tough conversations and, you know, in order to heal these childhood traumas, right. sometimes you have to talk to your parents. And I am, um, I also deal with childhood trauma, but unfortunately my mother has passed away and I know that you mm -hmm. can empathize with that, um, with losing your father, uh, not too long ago. Mm -hmm. In a situation where you don't have access to your parents, how would one go about trying to resolve things from their past if they don't necessarily have the avenues like talking things out with their parents? Me, me personally, is if you can't get to the source, get to the get to the greater source. I, I know like that's right. About it. Um, I'm not I'm not a big advocate of, of giving out too much. Like, talk to God. That's what helped me. I can't even speak on nobody else. I could just speak for myself. Yeah. That's the first person I go to. I always tell people all the time, if you go to a friend for advice and the first thing they tell you is, hey, I'm going to give you some advice, but I think you should talk to God about it first. But I'm going to give you my advice, too. You should, probably shouldn't be seeking counsel from me. Yeah. Talk to God about it. You ha it's, it's, it has, it's more spiritual than anything. It's all a matter of how you think. And God can relieve anxiety. He can relieve stress over time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you can't have those, just and some, like I was saying before, sometimes it's just coming to terms with, these answers won't be answered, but how can I move forward from it? You know what I mean? Like that sometimes they won't get, you won't get those answers that you want for, but you don't want to have two dead people. You know, one person living that can't live and the one that's already deceased. You know, a lot of people, they, they, they stay with the dead. You got to keep living. You know what I'm yep. saying? I say that all the time. They will want you to keep living regardless. Like if, if they, if you let their trauma affect you and they're passed away and it still affect you while you living, that's not good. You want to, no. you know what I'm saying? Let it go. It's easier said than done because I've had to do it, but I had to make like terms with a lot of things that I didn't get answers for. You just like, you're in a grateful situation. You look around and, you know, maybe you didn't have your dad or maybe you didn't have your mom. 
But you see people that didn't have their mom or dad, or you see people that didn't have a mom, and they like, man, I wish I had a mom. Just right. Be for what you have, because the grass right. isn't always greener. You know what I mean? Mm-mm. So. Grass is green where you water it at. Mm-hmm. Right. Ali, I saw this post not too uh, long ago, probably like yesterday, as a matter of fact, but it was like, we all are dealing with childhood trauma, yet we show children no grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How are you, as it relates to your son and fatherhood, especially black, right. you're raising a black male, you're, you're mm-hmm. raising this black little boy and the world is going to, the world are not, the world is not nice to black men. No, not at all. The world is not nice mm-hmm. to y'all. So, what are you instilling in him surrounding mental health mm-hmm. that crazy, you wish you would have known or you would tools you would have been given? You know, how are you kind of changing the curve in parenting as it relates to your son? So, so that's a great question. So a lot of times in my relationships, man, I was taught, don't cry, man, suck it up. You know, and you hear this a lot and it sounds so cliche for most men, but it's a thing for every man. So when I get in, when I got older and started getting into relationships, I used to suppress how I feel so much until it all bottled up and then I exploded. And I used to do this over and over and over again. I never knew how to express my feelings when they when they unfolded right then and there because I felt like I was never in the right place to say it. Like you a man, you're not supposed to be feeling like that. Yeah. Right. So one thing that I instill in my son is that, hey son, this world is very problematic. You can go cry, man. You can go let those emotions out. But yeah. just know, I care about your emotions, but that problem you're facing doesn't. You know what I'm saying? Every new problem, every new challenge is going to come with emotions. So you have to deal with those emotions. That's a byproduct. You have to deal with the emotions. Deal with them. Let it out. Cry. But just know, son, you still going to have to get it done. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's what, that's what I let them know. Like, this world comes with challenges. And I wish I would have known that, man. You could talk about your problems. Um, Just be around people that can serve you through those problems because everybody not your friend. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. Wish you know what I'm saying? I wish, like, you know, I would have been told to just stick to one woman. Like, you know, I, I wish it was nailed in my head to just wait until marriage to have sex. Things like this. Things <laughs> Talk about that it. I'm going to teach my son. You know, I don't just be bringing people around my son. You know what I'm saying? I don't be just taking him in certain environments. But I don't want to, you know what I'm saying, coddle him to the point where, you know what I'm saying? Because the world, he's going to have to face it, too. That's a big right. thing, too. At some point, your son, you can coddle him in the house and protect him. But at some point, he's going to be a grown man. And he has to learn how to be out there in society. You know what I mean? So this world is crazy. Just being that third line of defense, like he goes to school, has to be parents over peers because those are the people they are around the most. They're influenced. They're very impressionable at that age. So your kids coming home talking to you about these things really listen to your kids because some things that they say may catch a red flag if you're ignoring your kids conversation because they little voices can be annoying sometimes you might miss some things that they really want to let you know yeah so my conversations after angelo has been around people that you know i'm saying aren't his family i just like to listen to him and you know i'm saying see what he's saying and cipher through yeah yeah cipher through these thoughts and emotions because kids emotions and thoughts are at the front of their brain they're Always, not, yeah. I don't let you forget anything that they're trying to tell you. They're going to tell you. So, just, you know, I just like to listen. And, you know what I'm saying? What? And just question and see, you know. So, just paying attention to them and, let, and just like being more gentle. Because I, I started out real harsh, hitting them all the time, yelling, cursing. But for men out there, if you want to be better parents, just you got you to gotta study, you got to learn. You know what I'm saying? Learn psychology, learn child development. It's, it's, yeah. it's really key. You know what I'm saying? It's really key. And through child development, I've learned that we do parenting all wrong. Yeah. And there's certain research and, and things that can back up uh, gentle parents and actually working. Yeah. Better than a, like beating your kids. Like they say, like, if you want to get your kids to do anything, a lot of people say take stuff away. But it's really the rewarding system that works the best to get your kids to do anything. You yeah. I mean? Just learning, being just willing to learn, learning new. If you don't want to learn new and you don't want to parent new, then <laughs> you're going to parent old. But just know it's going to have them same effects on your child and it's going to be a trickle down effect. I right. wanted to change it. I wanted to be the, the one to try to change, you know what I'm saying, that dynamic and like that, you know, so. And you know what? Every time I go to therapy, I, it's like sometimes, and I don't know if this is a good or bad thing, but sometimes I, I think I'm parenting in fear. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I want, um, especially millennial black parents to really have a face-to-face 
conversation with themselves about, you know, we are the generation of curse breakers. We are the generation of change. We are, you know, the, the, they call us the new millennials for a reason. So we introduce this gentle parenting thing. Um, and I feel like a lot of times where I can't speak for everybody, but for me, it was the, my parenting style. I don't really think I'm a gentle parent. I'm more of like a generational curse breaker parent. Yeah. I, I guess that's what you would call me too. Just like, not like just. Yeah. Cause I'm so, somewhere sometimes the these kids not gentle. They don't gentle kids. Somewhere in the middle for sure. Being more Definitely somewhere let, in the let, middle. Letting them talk. Cause I didn't get that. That's one thing that I didn't Letting them, let talk. them talk. My mom would just tell me, just shut up. Get letting off. them ask why. Yeah, that's that. I, I I let Angela ask why because that's one thing that really I hated growing up. I she never want to tell me why. Like I tell him why, and then after that, I'm like, I told you why. Now just get it done for me. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I just wanted the explanation. You tell yeah. me I can go outside. I just tell me why. If it makes sense, then I'm done. Right. <laughs> or but if, if, it, if it don't, I ain't gonna go outside if anyway. If it don't make sense. But like when you do that, man. You stop your kids from asking questions too, and a lot of creativity yes. comes from asking questions and being yes. kids, you know. So you all this stuff that we're doing is is a program system that was set up to just keep us where we are mentally. Yes, challenging your questioning system is very bad for kids. They need to keep that creative that creative spark all the way up until they're adults. Don't kill it because if you kill it, like even with their dreams, like it's good to discipline your kids, but not with their dreams. Never tell them they can and cannot do something. If they feel right. like they can jump out a window. Tell them, son, one day you'll be able to jump out of six. You know what I'm saying? That's very important when they when they develop, and that's super important. That's right. one thing my mom always did, and that's why I'm so confident to this day. My mom, it never never was a time through my childhood or whenever when she was ever telling us we couldn't do something. It was, whatever you do, son, you're going to be the best at it. Whatever you do, son, you're going to be the best at it. Whatever you, That's why I love her so much to this day, because I see how important it is. And little boys, like, pouring into them she always poured it into us you know what i'm saying so that's super important definitely. most definitely um and then circling back like you know the fear thing i think sometimes we parent in a way that we don't want to repeat the same mistakes mm-hmm. that our parents made um but it's like you said it's it's taking what we've learned through therapy through the you know the studies of psychology mm-hmm. and then trying to apply it so that our kids don't have to relive that trauma yeah, sure. um and i think the generation that the millennials are raising they're going to be they're going to be way more dope i think no, they're going to be do miraculous things because mm-hmm. we're able to parent them in a way where without so many restrictions mentally Social media was a big part of that. Um, you see, you see a Talk lot of people. It. You see a lot of people like, man, maybe let me try that. Hey, did you know, man? Let me try that. Man, yeah, try that. it has as much as we like to clown social, social media. Social media, it really helps a lot. Really, it does. It really, it really, it really, really does. Mm-hmm. It get communities, Facebook pages, like the access to information. So the more information we get, the better we can be as parents. Because the more you can learn. If you're having a difficult time with your child. Or whatever this turned into something totally different but but yeah mm-hmm. but yeah you know but that's all a part of mental health dealing with kids is all a part of it yeah pa- definitely parents. definitely Especially for the mothers you know what i'm saying it's the dads too you know what i'm saying but because you got to be there fully for your kids you know what i'm saying so just spending time by yourself too making sure you get time by yourself that's important if you are a veteran, active duty service member, or civilian that is currently in a mental health crisis or suffers from mental health issues, please dial 988. Trained crisis responders are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the calls are completely confidential. Again, that number is 988. Veterans and service members, press 1. You don't have to suffer in silence. I'm